Uh, so first of all, welcome to another talk in our series, Conversations with the Past. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maureen Folk, and I'm the Outreach and Program Coordinator here at the museum. I think most of you have heard that line probably 50 times at this point. Uh, so before our speaker begins, I'd like to introduce him. This is uh, Winston Grady Willis. He is pro a professor and founding director of Black Studies at Skidmore College. Most recently, he was inaugural director of the School of Gender, Race, and Nations at Portland State University and professor and chair of Africana Studies at MSU Denver. While at Syracuse University, where he taught in the Department of African American Studies, he received the Meredith Teaching Recognition Award. His first book, Challenging U.S. Apartheid, Atlanta and Black Struggles for Human Rights, 1960 to 1977, mm -hmm. seeks to provide a gendered examination of the transition between nonviolent uh, direct action and Black power during the contemporary Black freedom movement. He is also lead author of the electronic textbook, The Struggle Continues, Historical and Contemporary Issues in Africana Studies. So please join me in welcoming uh, Winston for his talk, uh, Revisiting Black Histories, Local Stories, Transnational Impact. Thank you, Marie. I really appreciate it. I, uh, just full confession, I may stand and then I may sit. I have a few mechanical issues with my prosthesis, my artificial legs. So every now and then I'm just kind of jump up, uh, down. Um, so I'll share this with you because I overheard some of the conversation and Ben had mentioned um, Boston and busing. And so I should tell you, I, my hometown is Denver, Colorado. And so I was born in 1965, so I'm 57, I'm gonna give you a sense of who I am. Uh, uh, the prosthesis, I was actually born with a congenital birth defect. So I've actually known walking with an artificial leg since I was two. So it's just kind of like second nature. But um, every now and then, it's like you have to get you know our cars fixed to get from a which is like that's the best uh, thing I can, I can like, way I can put it. So uh, well, my anyway. body needs an overhaul. So. <laughs> I'm right behind you. I'm right behind you. No, uh, and, I'm, and then I'm third in line. Um, so I understand. Um, but but then I just wanted to share growing up in Denver. So I'm a child of court ordered desegregation. So I grew up in the Park Hill neighborhood in Denver, which at the time was predominantly, arguably through the 1970s, early 80s, overwhelmingly African-American. Um, now, if I go back to my old neighborhood, there's only one black person on the, on the block. I mean, gentrification is a national issue anyway. So I was bused from fourth grade Actually, one semester in second grade, but from fourth grade all the way to graduating from high school, I was bused from Northeast Denver to either Southeast Denver or West Denver. So I just wanted to share with you. So I remember well, you know, getting on those buses um, and establishing some friendships that I otherwise would not have established. There's no question about it. So I just wanted to share that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about which is important here at the Chapman Museum, uh, local history, but local history and a connection to what I call the transnational. I'll try to explain that in a bit. Um, I'll see this. But, but before we begin, before we get into it, just want to share an acknowledgement, land acknowledgement. Uh, this is pretty similar to the one that I will often put on a syllabus at, at Skidmore, a few words might change, but I just wanted to show this with you. Um, as we meet at the Chapman Museum this evening, we are especially mindful to recognize that we live, work, learn on the original homelands of the Kanye Kaheka or Mohawk peoples, the easternmost members of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy, who made their homes in and along the Mohawk and Hudson River valleys long before the arrival of both Europeans and Africans to this, to this area. As such, they were the, quote, keepers of the eastern door of this larger confederacy, which consisted of several complex matrilineal societies. Furthermore, we also acknowledge that these groups, along with other indigenous peoples throughout the Americas, 
continue to confront ongoing efforts to marginalize them that are, I would argue, you don't have to agree with me, right? Uh, contemporary manifestations of a legacy of enslavement, colonialism, and genocide. Uh, oftentimes in this country, we think of enslavement as tied to people of direct African descent, but it was also true, not only here in the Northeast for a very, very brief period of time, but also in what is today the Southwest for indigenous peoples, as some of you know. So I just wanted to just kind of say, so just kind of a reminder of where we are, kind of a debt that I think we owe. You don't have to agree with me, but we'll. So this is the outline. Now, that's one, two, three, four, five, hopefully six sections. The sixth section is not even up there. Uh, so like, how the heck are we going to do this in such a brief time? I believe in mo moving, keeping it moving. So we'll be, I'll begin with a few words of introduction. From there, I'm going to say a little bit about the Haitian Revolution. One of the things I'm going to try to do throughout, especially letter B, letter C, is talk about particular themes in either global African history or African American history. And I'm going to try to make an argument for a connection between the local and the transnational. Okay, so a few words of introduction, then talk about the Haitian Revolution, then the Atlanta student movement, which is tied to my first book project. Um, then we're gonna come back here to upstate New York. We'll just say a little bit there, and then I've got just a few final thoughts if time allows. So are we good? Oh, that's okay. Good. All right. So in terms of an introduction, so one thing I want to say, and I think you folks know this already, there's certain kind of long-standing tensions or, or a give and take, if you will, uh, for those of us who are students of history, and everyone in this room is a student of history. The first is this, this tension between the local and the national, okay? So we might think of it in terms of local politics, versus national politics, okay? We can make an argument historically, whether you are a card-carrying member of the grand old party, a card-carrying member of the Democratic Party or an independent, doesn't matter. But there's usually a difference between kind of the political landscape at the national level and what's often happening at the local level, right? So we know this already. This is that tension between the local and the national. There's another tension, and it's it's related. It's related to the first one. That's the tension between looking at the history of great individuals, usually men, often white, but in this context, usually black, but still men. Right? This tension between these great individuals, Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X, for example, and the grassroots movements that they were a part of in some way. Okay, so the, the case of Dr. King, for instance. So should we really focus on Dr. King exclusively, or should we focus on those thousands of foot soldiers in Montgomery, for instance, who walk three to five miles a day, irrespective of their health, their age, if they were domestic workers, in order to make the Montgomery bus boycott a success, right? So those, those tensions were, were familiar. Okay. So I want to introduce Maybe not for everybody, but another element, and that's the term transnational. And all these things are related, I would argue. But so when I'm saying transnational, one element of it is what I call border crossing or boundary crossing. Okay. That could be geopolitical borders. It could also be borders in terms of the way we think about certain things. We'll, we'll talk about this in a moment, okay? So what does that mean? It means looking at immigration with an E, right? Immigration, this process of individuals leaving one locale to go to another, okay? So just a question for anybody. When we think of immigration or immigration, two ends and I, either way, what do we usually, what comes to mind now? For us here in the United States, we think of immigration. Ellis Island. Okay, Ellis Island, absolutely. 
Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty. Anything else? Rio Rio Grande. Grande. What's it? Rio Grande. Rio Grande, absolutely. Yeah. Rio Grande. Right? That, those borderlands border. between what's today border. Texas and yeah. maybe Mexico. Right, absolutely. In this case, this is what I want you to think about. The two examples you, you gave, which were absolutely right, you can see I'm not going to look at the sheet. Bill <laughs> and Sarah, yes. yeah, deal with country to country immigration, right? When we think of, of immigration in transnational terms as scholars, I want you to also think about immigration simply from a town to a city. Or from an urban, I mean, from a rural existence to an urban. Okay. Or you might even think of this may sound absurd, but even with the context of a particular city, particularly a metroplex, going from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. Okay. If you're familiar with Boston, I can name other cities: New York City, uh, Atlanta. What neighborhood you're in says a lot about you. Right? There's certain rivalries between neighborhoods that are unfortunately sometimes deadly. Right? And so it's kind of thing like border crossing, immigration. And then also when we're, we're talking about the, the transnational, again, crossing borders and ways of thinking. So for instance, I'm someone who embraces the humanities and social sciences. But they're they they're, there's sometimes a line between the two. Transnational work tries to intentionally blur that line or to go back and forth across those boundaries. I'll give you a concrete example. Almost every semester that I teach, even though in many ways I'm trained as a social scientist, I will often assign fiction. That's intentional. That's, that's a conscious part of kind of a a border crossing for me intellectually. Okay? All right. Now, try to remember this last thing. In terms of the significance of this transnational thing, I'm going to make an argument. You might agree with me, you may disagree, but we'll see if I provide enough evidence for it. Probably will. But we'll, we'll give it a shot. Um, the part of the significance about thinking transnationally rests with challenging notions of exceptionalism. So kind of kind of remember that challenging notions of exceptionalism, what do I mean? I'm going to come back to that probably at the very end. Okay. All right. Thank you again for setting this up. Okay. <laughs> no, I really, really appreciate it. So the things that I want to highlight, just briefly. Let me just have a few minutes. Huh? Resistance and resiliency, and then the context is the Haitian Revolution. Now, I purposely, I intentionally didn't throw dates up there, but if you want to know, in terms of the, the very beginning embers of the revolution and then the end point, we'd say 1791 to 1804. Okay, so we're talking the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th. So we're going way back in time, okay? Now, one key element of what becomes the Haitian Revolution are these grassroots resistance movements in various localities. So I'll give you an example. One resistance movement, and this again, this is resistance to slavery. Okay? Remember at the time, San Domingue, which is what it was referred to before the name became Haiti, was the crown jewel of the French colonial system, right? That the, the French empire in terms of sugarcane and the profits from sugarcane. Uh, it was literally the engine that drove the French economy. That is not an exaggeration. Okay, it's that, that important, okay? And slavery on that half of the island of other half, of course, is what is today the Dominican Republic. Uh, slavery was brutal, but the profits for France were, were immense. Okay? So, one key resistance movement 
was led by a gentleman, I don't expect you to remember this name, Duddy Buchmann, D-U-T-T-Y, Buchmann, B-O-U-K-M-A-N. Google all of this later. Buchmann is really important. He was what you might call an early practitioner of voodoo. We often say today, incorrectly, voodoo, right? But a practitioner of voodoo. He believed that ancestors, he would argue that the ancestors were watching every move, that the ancestors of the individuals and that particular communication, what we today call Haitian community. Um, and that to pay respect to those ancestors, there were certain things that you did ritualistic. Okay? And we have to get into all the specifics. But he tied this belief in ancestral worship to resistance against enslavement. He was really, really successful at it. So much so that the French colonial authorities kind of put a target on his back. Okay. He would eventually give his life for the cause, and then others, names that you may be a bit more familiar with, will step in. Individuals who are a bit more privileged, um, who would in some cases become generals, like Toussaint, Leo Matur. Okay. There were others. jean claude Dessain. You have to remember all the names. But the key is that these local movements are really important. Okay. <clears throat> that, I'm going to move to CLR James. How many of you have heard the name? Okay. I'm not sure. Whether... Okay. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. Uh, CLR James is a Caribbean intellectual, uh, an amazing sports writer. Loved to write about soccer and cricket. Uh, but he was also a historian, right? This intellectual. And he wrote a book called Black Jacobins. And so here's where we, we come back to this notion of the transnational connection between the local and these larger forces. So those of you, if you remember your European history, when the French Revolution takes place, sort of the, the leading force, those individuals who were arguing for, for liberty were the Jacobins, right? There's a small free black community in San Domingue that refers to themselves as black Jacobins. They say, well, okay, we know that there was this revolution against England that took place in North America, that it was successful, right? End up with the Constitution in 1787. Just two years later, we see what happens in France. Right? There's this call for democracy in France and an end to monarchy. Well, guess what? We would like to be able to vote as well. Right? We, would have, we would like to have some semblance of rights. So this is the small free black community. So if you know anything about San Domingue, the vast majority of people are enslaved Africans. Right? But then you've got some French colonists who are really small in numbers but have some privilege. Then you've got this quote I almost want to, even want to use the word free, this, like this quasi free black community. These are these black jacketers. One of them is Toussaint. Okay. Then you've got this group of individuals who would, today's language, we would say biracial. Folks who are of mixed racial ancestry. There's only one race. You know that's homo sapiens sapiens, right? So that race is a social construction, right? And so the, 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 this, this, this mixed group, again, pretty small enough, okay? C.L.R. James's point is this. What happens in France actually mattered to key individuals on this island where slavery is taking place. Those individuals began to have conversations with the local resistance leaders, folks like Bukman, 
And over time, a revolutionary movement takes place. It's really amazing what happens in Haiti. Now, remember, what's the poorest nation state in the Western Hemisphere right now? Mm -hmm. Haiti, absolutely. That case actually is Haiti. Okay. And so we think, well, can we kind of keep that in mind, kind of follow that away, right? We've seen the assassination of, of, of Haiti's president, you know, not that long ago. We see all this turmoil, all this instability. Like, what the heck? You know, what's going on here? So let's move forward, because I promise we'd, we'd, we'd sail through. Oh my God, I've got speed up. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're uh, so, in terms of transnational impact that these local struggles have, just two things. I'm going to ask you on this first one what is the transnational impact of the Haitian Revolution for U.S. history? It's very concrete. It's game changing. Yes. Are we guessing? Sure. Yeah. You can guess. Sure. <laughs> Is it economic? Is that the biggest? You cannot, but yeah, but even more specific. That's good because the answer is yes. But even. No sugar. Okay, no sugar. That's good. That's actually very good. But even more so, I'm telling you folks, this is game changing. And I'm telling you. No I slaves? Still, well. No slaves are still coming. Right. Well, see, that's the thing. Yeah. We still have enslaved Africans coming to the U.S. That's good, though. Though for only four more years, by sea. Okay, but we know illegally a few more did come. Uh, but that's good. That's good. Okay, let's do it this way. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Because we, we, we all, we were just pretending back in social studies. Um, <laughs> maybe middle school. What is often considered the third U.S. president's greatest achievement? Third U.S. president, Thomas Jefferson. Louisiana Purchase. Absolutely. Kate is correct. Did you start the Louisiana the, Purchase? Uh, Louisiana Purchase. Right? And we know the narrative because we've read it for years, which is that the savvy Thomas Jefferson found a way to have Napoleon, the great Napoleon, give the United States the Louisiana Territory. We're not even going to get into the argument of what, what is the indigenous claim to all that territory. We won't, mm -hmm. We're going to leave that alone. But for a, for a virtual pittance, the United States literally doubles in size. It's absolutely game-changing. It's a game-changing event in the history of this nation. But it does not happen before the Haitian Revolution. Let me explain. I don't know if anyone here has served their, their country, my father, my father. Uh, father-in-law and my stepmom are all uh, military veterans. Um, we're familiar with the Vietnam War, right? And many folks were, oh my God, Vietnam has become a quagmire. We know that Russia is in the news vis-a-vis -vis the war in Ukraine. Before Ukraine, Afghanistan, of course, was often referred to as the Soviet Union's, you know, Vietnam. What all of those folks can say, we could say in the US, Vietnam is our Haitian Revolution. Let me explain. Over 15,000 French troops died on that island. Over half died due to yellow fever. But a significant portion died because the Haitian generals, very familiar with the, the landscape, right, are able to outmaneuver. Things get so bad that Napoleon tells Leclerc, his, his, his greatest general, he says, I'm going to give you an expeditionary force of over 5,000 men. Put this war to an end. Leclerc can't do it. 
Now, Napoleon gets some measure of revenge. He writes letters to Toussaint. Toussaint, his, his, his biggest failing is that he thinks he's a Frenchman. Napoleon figures this out. He says, oh, we, let's meet as equals in Paris. And Toussaint says, absolutely. He says, I'll send a ship for you. Toussaint says, oh, beautiful. And of course, Toussaint doesn't reach Paris. He dies in a, in a, a prison on the French coast. Okay, Napoleon got it. But Napoleon and France did not win the actual war. Okay. France was almost bankrupt by the Haitian Revolution. So much so, desperate for, I mean, literally cash strapped. Napoleon agrees to the Louisiana Purchase. And so to this day, most of us in this country have no idea that the geographic Literally, the square miles of the earth literally double, actually more than double, as a result of the Louisiana Purchase. But it has a direct connection to what happens in terms of the Haitian Revolution. Okay. Now, in terms of African American resistance, this is the other key piece. Every attempted rebellion from 1804 until Nat Turner's Rebellion in 1831, I'm talking about in the United States, is informed by the Haitian Revolution as a catalyst. Okay? And so I'm not going to go any more detail. I'm going to, I'm going to change slides because we're in it. It's so, uh, But Denmark Vesey's attempted rebellion in South Carolina, Gabriel Prosser's attempted rebellion, in Virginia, Charles Dislong's rebellion outside of New Orleans in 1811. Each of these was informed by the Haitian Revolution. Each of these individuals believed that if that local rebellion would be a success, that an effort could be made to establish contact with, with Haiti. This is it's heavy duty stuff. One last thing, I promise, we're going to move on. This is not the sole explanation for Haiti's situation. I wouldn't dare say that. There's been mismanagement. There have been dictators, both Papa Doc, Baby Doc, Dubaye, right? Those names are. But we have to acknowledge something. The Haitian Revolution was considered such a seismic event that the United States, together with France, Germany, European powers, but agreed to blockade the island for more than 25 years after the revolution. Right? A full military blockade so that the island couldn't trade. We know that later on, right, at the beginning of the, the 20th century, the U.S. occupied Haiti for almost 20 years right, to protect banking investments. So U.S. Marines were in Haiti from 1905 to 1933. 1915, I'm sorry, 1932. My math. So it's important to try to understand that some of these other layers. Okay. All right. I'm running my mouth. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move. We're going to move on intentionally to Atlantis. We're going to move from the very beginning of the 19th century to the second half of the 20th century. Do that intention. We're going to move forward. So the things that I want to focus on: self-determination and redefinition. Self-determination and redefinition. So we're talking about the Haitian Revolution. We're talking about resistance and resilience. Okay. So here's the context. You know this story, folks. February first, nineteen sixty. Four first-year students from a historically black college in Greensboro, North Carolina, go to Woolworths. They go to the lunch counter, dressed in their Sunday best, and they politely request a cup of coffee. Of course, the request is denied because the lunch counters are segregated, which actually means that Blacks aren't allowed to sit at 
This event on February 1st starts this. I mean, that word spread. This is before <laughs> cell phones. This is before computers. I don't know. But folks get on the phone, start mimeographing. Soon, students in Tennessee, both in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Nashville, students throughout North Carolina, some students in Alabama, also all these college, black college students, start sitting in at lunch counters. And the Atlanta students are starting to feel a bit embarrassed because they haven't done anything yet. And now it's the month of March. Schools like Morehouse College, the All Men's College, Spelman College, the All Women's College in Atlanta. Right? There's six historically black institutions in Atlanta. These students finally go to the presidents of the institution, like, look, we were ready. We, we, we want to get out there. We want to do something. And the presidents say, you know what? What can you do to differentiate yourselves from these other students? Now, I'm just going to give you one name as an example. One of the students from some of the struggles in, in Nashville, who was a student at the time, is someone, a congressman who would, would become Congressman John Lewis. Okay, to give you an example. Some of, some of the most well-known names. <laughs> now, there's some folks who ended up kind of living a life of infamy, if you will, like Marion Barry, right? mayor of D.C. I mean, so not everybody, you know, was, uh, but most folks, we can say, uh, are just extraordinary individuals, right? Um, so these are last students like, what are we going to do? They finally sit down and they're like, this is what we're going to do. We're actually going to write a statement in which we lay out our concerns about how segregation is just this assault on our dignity. The school president said, you know what? If you all can come up with this statement, we will pay for it to be published in each of the Atlanta newspapers. That's exactly what happened. And so in March of 1960, an appeal for human rights was published. And I'll read this for you in case the, the writers listen. Uh, the entire statement is much longer. It's a full page ad in the Atlanta Journal, the Atlanta Constitution, and the Atlanta Daily World, which is a black newspaper in Atlanta. Uh, quote We, the students of the six affiliated institutions forming the Atlanta University Center, have joined our hearts minds and bodies in the cause of gaining those rights which are inherently ours as members of the human race and as citizens of these United States. And they go on later to say, every normal human being wants to walk the earth with dignity and abhors any and all proscriptions being placed upon, I inserted them and said him, uh, because of race or color. In essence, this is the meaning of the sit-down protests that are sweeping this nation today. So here's the key thing, folks. All right? We're going to move on in the interest of time. These students, one of them was Lonnie King, he was a Morehouse student, a Navy veteran, served in the Navy, been overseas, A Spelman student named Herschel Schallenberg, I don't expect you to remember that either, would go on to be an ambassador, would work for the U.S. State Department. She traveled, she was able to get a scholarship, she traveled to France, she traveled to different places. These students had experiences outside of the U.S. They were extraordinarily well read, they were familiar with the Declaration of Human Rights, the U.N. They said, we're not talking about civil rights. <clears throat> we're talking about human rights here. And they were really, really intentional about it. Okay. What's my point? If you look at these struggles transnationally, 
you move from you seeing them as this limited civil rights movement in a strictly U.S. context to instead part of a larger struggle that should be seen in an international context. Okay. Am I making sense? Sort of kind of, oh, oh my gosh, moving on. <laughs> okay, finally, upstate. I'm just going to touch upon three things, and I'm, I'm going to shut my mouth and kind of open things up. Um, one thing, we're all familiar with Solomon Northrop, right? 12 years a slave. We're familiar with, 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 with the story taken as a free man from Saratoga Springs, ends up being enslaved, finally 12 years later, returns back to Saratoga Springs, but to where? Lynn's Falls. Lynn's Falls. That's right. Okay. So the first point, I intentionally didn't want to spend too much time talking about Solomon Northrop this today, but this is just, maybe we have a, another conversation, but what might it look like if we talked about not only Solomon Northrop, uh, but other abolitionists, which is what it's going to lead me to the second point. Um, what if we talk about them not just as local stories, but as local stories connected to larger movements, not only in the U.S., but perhaps there's we can use our imaginations to think of even current challenges, individuals who are challenging um, you know, human trafficking, for instance. And, and this movement of bodies across borders. Are there ways in which Solomon Northrop's story could be a conversation? I don't know. I'm just asking, just throwing it out. Okay. Um, how many of you saw last month, because it appeared on PBS, Paul Miller's Searching for Timbuktu? Okay, don't worry. I'm not going to show it, but I just want to give you here's the, the clip. You can go, just Google Searching for Timbuktu. You can go to the local PBS website and you can actually just view, if you have access to a computer, you can view all 56 minutes of the documentary. <clears throat> this film, I cannot say, but have you seen it? I have but I've, I've talked with Paul Miller. Okay. Trying to get the most of them screening. Okay. <laughs> if you do, I'll turn. <laughs> if you do, I'll be here and unlike tonight. I'll try to get members of my family because they, they don't want to hear me. <laughs> Folks, I cannot say this. I won't give too much away, except for to say this is such a nuance, such, such an important film on so many levels. Um, and what it talks about is, I, I can say this, but this is just a case. Um, the great aboli white abolitionist Garrett Smith, really important. Uh, I had a former colleague at Syracuse University, Milton Cernet. This written about it's an old book, but I, I'm telling you, if you can find it, you might, might be able to get a public library. Abolitions with an apostrophe S. Yes. Abolitions Acts. A X E. Abolitions Acts. Um, goes into detail. He makes the case that Garrett Smith should be mentioned in line with William Lloyd Garris in terms of kind of the great. Treating those abolitionists who are economically privileged. Um, Garrett Smith basically, with some others, provides land in the southern Adirondacks for those black families who'd be willing to farm it as a way of getting around legislation that says that voting rights have to be tied to property ownership. I'm not going to say anymore. It's a great film. It draws on the work of local scholars, There's a local archaeologists out of SUNY Potsdam. It's just a great film. Um, it's really, really important. The interesting thing for me, though, and I'll come back to this in the final thoughts, is that the film ends in a very contemporary moment. I'm not going to say anymore. You haven't seen it yet, but I'm really searching for Timbuktu. This is a spelling, the correct spelling is T-I-M-B-U-T-K-U, Timbuktu, 
true place, real place, right, in West Africa, a uh, great citadel of learning in the kingdom of Mali. Okay, and so this was just the spelling of quasi free blacks here. They're not the same. It's just oh, incredible. All right, so Solomon Northrop, Underground Railroad. Um, I'll say this too, just I'll just put this in your ears. Those of you, I think you mentioned the real brand. There's this whole field of studies, borderland studies, that focuses on the borderlands between the US and Mexico, that, that area, that region. But there's this argument that has a culture almost all its own, distinct in ways from, from Mexican culture, distinct in ways from US culture. It's just really complex. But oh, oh, just think about this. To what extent could we argue? particularly during the, the years of the Underground Railroad, that this region was part of a borderlands region with Southern Canada, where Blacks moved, literally, crisscrossed the borders, that there were these amazing alliances between white abolitionists and escaped enslaved Africans. What does that mean? Hey, oh, oh. And then the next thing out there, I'm doing this intentionally. This, this is gonna, when you see this photo, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning photo for crying out loud, but it's gonna evoke, I don't know what it will evoke. It evokes different things. Okay. This is the photo by photojournalist Steve Starr. When the Willard Strait takeover comes to an 1969 Cornell University, no one was hurt significantly. Right? One of the most controversial things to this day, even on the campus, is the fact that the faculty voted. Everybody was everybody in this photograph was expelled. They took over a building. Are there any Cornelians? Okay, yeah, so I'm a Cornelian too. 69, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh my God. I was what because you were the way there was something about the nod of your head. Um, so you correct me if that's anything that's wrong. We're gonna condense this, but I, I'm gonna I'll probably do some three minutes. So you you can do this better than I can take. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. Joe, getting emotional. I'm seriously, I uh, that's where I met my wife in Prime Oh. I, I, I digress, but August 29th, 1990, saw this woman in the summer dress I'm like, what is that? I mean, two years later we're married. Look at the same master's from Africa Studies, the master's book. Okay, anyway, okay. Rewind. There's a black women's cooperative on campus, Warry House, where a cross was burned. And so Kate knows very well, Ithaca's next door neighbor was Dryden, still is, the town of Dryden. The town of Dryden is sort of an unofficial Ku Klux Klan headquarters for decades in New York, in central New York. Yeah. It's real, right? It was the burning of that cross that sort of ignited, was kind of the key catalyst for the events of the next 36 hours. So I'm going to, right, I don't know if you want to, anything you would want to share, this is the key thing. Everyone in this photograph was expelled. The faculty then voted that individuals should be given amnesty. The administration agreed. The campus remained, and not just white students. Remained torn about whether or not this was the right decision. And what I can say is this everyone in the photograph graduated most with honors. Okay. Several folks would go on to be professors. Uh, this individual here, the bandolier, um, would go on to be still alive, as uh, active as a, a community activist and, and organizer. Um, but again, my point here, if what happened in Atlanta with the students, the 
attempting this, this redefinition, saying, okay, civil rights, no. We say human rights, okay? What can not only what happened at Cornell in 1969, but also what's happened at so many places, and Skidmore is literally like the last place, it's a whole nother conversation. But I mean, so many, Hamilton College, Colgate, University of Clinton, where Black Studies is established. And the key thing is this, in no instance is it done by Black students exclusively. In each case, there are alliances and friendships with white students, other students of color as well, right? and faculty who are supporting. So, so what, what can this mean if you look at like a local story like this? Oh, by the way, Kate probably knows this. I mean, listen, so where do these students get these weapons? Oh, no, no, it's anybody. Just take it again. Gun shop and drive. <laughs> you would think. Well, well actually, wait, no, let me rewind. If a white student bought the weapons for them, like an ally, right? I can guarantee you at that time, no white, per white person in Dryden is going to sell a black person a weapon. But maybe a white person, that's actually. So maybe anything, any other guesses? Yeah, this goes back to this borderlands idea. Just quick, what we can try to wrap this up. Canada? Great. I get Canada, perhaps. But the answer is in the interest of time. These students received these weapons from the black residents on the south side of Italy. That popular community is really small now. It was bigger at this time. But the south side community of Ithaca has its roots going back to the Underground Railroad. These were the individuals who would sometimes be harassed and be terrorized by the driving clan, often felt a need to be armed. And so at this critical moment, we can, we can have differences of opinion about whether or not this is justified or not. Um, but these students were concerned Word spread to black folk in town, and these black folks said, well, we can help you out. You know, just don't let anybody know where you got these weapons from, but we can get them to you because we have to rely on these weapons, just showing them to get the plan off our back over here. All right, moving on. We're, we're wrapping up, I promise. No one fell asleep. No. Uh, so here, here's my final thought. I mean, listen, so this is the final thought. Remember, I mentioned that a transnational approach, I would argue, is a way of moving away from exceptionalism. There's African American exceptionalism historically. There are also notions of US exceptionalism. And this is what's been on my mind. You don't have to agree with it. But when the insurrection happened, on January 6th. It was called insurrection, riot, attempted coup. Let me, you know, I would argue, you have to agree, I'd argue all terms of the, would apply. Okay. One of the first things that most commentators said was, this doesn't happen in the US. Okay. One commentator said, this would happen in a banana republic, not here. Mm. That's a lo really loaded term, right? I was just simply making this argument that, well, maybe there's some ways in which the U.S. isn't necessarily so different from other countries. You know, maybe one could argue, you have to agree, but that if we're not careful, this is irrespective of ideology or what the political party believes. But if truth, just fundamentally, becomes such a casualty, then you have to start thinking perhaps seriously, perhaps not so seriously, about parallels with the Weimar Republic right? in Germany. I argue, as an educator, and as an educator, that one of the most important things that, that I can do is simply 
not only try to have students think critically, uh, don't parrot what I say, uh, do their own investigative work, think independently, um, but also have some respect for authenticity of sources, <laughs> right? Rigorous scholarly research. Again, just put our kids all the time. We have a 22 year old, 18 year old, 14 year old. There are times when I use Wikipedia. Absolutely. I acknowledge it. I said, but don't have to be your sole source. It's like, be careful what you look at. Won't do it today. We could do an exercise real quick. If you go to a certain website, for instance, I mentioned Dr. King earlier. If you go to a certain website and you think you're looking at a website about the King holiday, you keep going further and further and further. Next thing you know, you're in a white supremacist website. That's just, that's the reality, right? That's kind of the, the, the situation we find ourselves in that. So that's just my final thought. Um, it's not a finished thought, so I, I promise. I'm not, it's not fully formed yet, but um, the more I spend time in Saratoga Springs in this area, meet some incredible folks, some folks who I agree with, disagree with, that's fine. But I've also encountered, and I've spoken to Skidmore students who've encountered some of the most virulent hate in the past couple of years. I mean, some stories. Um, one student isn't coming back in the fall because of what happened to him downtown in Saratoga Springs uh, from, 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 from a group of individuals who just, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say anymore. His mother is actually a professor at Harvard, uh, black student. Um, there's got to be a way and all the polarization to be able to have moments like this where we can look at history, look at the conversation between the historical moment and the present moment, uh, just be able to talk. So that's it for me. Special thanks again to you, Maurice. Special thanks to all of you for uh, being here, those in spirit. And with that, it is, I went too long. I, I said I wouldn't go past 745. It's 755. I don't know if we can have any conversation. <laughs> Everybody's got other things you got. You got to hit the road. No. But I'm, I'm fine. I mean, I could say if you have questions, comments. I'm, I'm happy to jump right in and, and yeah. say, first of all, thank you. I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs>